praise. Good morning, church. <laughs> Good morning. I would like to welcome myself back. <laughs> No, I just want to make you laugh. All right. So good morning. And I hope you all woke up with so much hope in your hearts that this COVID-19 and this season of complexity in, our, in your life will soon be over. That our great and faithful God has got our back, as you know, Brother Richard said two weeks ago. And he is in control of everything. So therefore, because God has got our back, there's nothing to fear because God loves you and me and His love never fails. Amen. All right. So, today, I will be continuing the fourth chapter of Thessalonians and I'll be talking about living for God's pleasure. Go. Living for God's pleasure in view of Christ's coming. Do you see that? Do you see that on your screen? And I would like... Right. There you go. There you go. And I would like to begin with a story about what happened to me a month ago. <laughs> it's my testimony. And it would be a shock to some of you if I tell you that I was forced to sign a resignation letter from the school that I had been working for 10 years, it was a high and it was a good and high paying job. But with just a snap of a finger, I found myself signing and vacating my position as a lead teacher. I admitted that I compromised my integrity and made decisions that were not really pleasing before God. I did not represent my belief well and my God through my imprudent behavior. And therefore, I have to go through painful consequences, you know, painful consequences of my judgments. And I realize that not all good intentions are always right. But to be always right is to obey. And obedience to the precepts of God is always right and good for us. And I remember the many nights, I, you know, the many nights I cried and prayed to God. It was tougher than I could think of, really, I'm telling you. But what gives me hope is that our God is a forgiving Father. And for those who are spiritually broken and having a contrite heart, you know, He's going to forgive you and He promised you that He's going to give you a new beginning. And once again, God reassured me of His amazing grace and reminded me that I still have hope. I certainly lost my job, but I did not lose my hope. Life can take anything away from me, okay? You know, that's the, the, I mean, that's the truth. Life can take anything away from us. But because I have Jesus, I have a living hope. And my hope is anchored to His Word in Jeremiah 29, 11. It's on your screen. So while I was in the, you know, in the uh, peak of my emotions, crying about what I did, so sorry of, of uh, you know, um, sometimes we just have to humble ourselves. You know, if we sin against God, just humble. And then God lead me to this promise. In Jeremiah 29, and it says there, For I know the plans I have for you. So when I was reading this, I am picturing God, like, you know, saying this to me personally. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster. To give you a future and a hope. Okay, a hope. So, Again, I look at the meaning of hope. What is hope? It says there, hope is being sure about something which you have to wait. So you hope for what you wait for, right? And you know that what you hope for will happen because God promised it. So in the Bible, hoping is not the same as wishing. Oh, I wish I could win a lottery. It's not like that. We know that what we hope for 
We wait for it. We patiently wait for it because we know that God has promised it. And when God said so, He will make sure that it will come to pass. But, but, but there's but in between. But you must wait. And in the process of waiting, what God is teaching me is to seek Him. You just don't wait and sit down that, oh, when it is going to, the, you know, when it is going to come, Lord, when I'm going to get a new job, when I'm going to, no. While you are waiting for God's answer, seek Him. And during the seeking time, God, you know, His, you know, the Holy Spirit is revealing so many things to me. And the more I seek Him, the more I know Him, the more my heart is at peace that God is taking good care of me. And He will do the same for you. He will do the same for you. So, back again to that verse in Jeremiah. I believe God knows what He's doing and He's got it all planned out for me and my family. And the good news out of the bad news is that God has been extending His loving kindness and sustaining us in different ways imaginable. So this is the first episode of my story. This is just the first episode. So the next one, I'm going to tell that to you next time. And I'm sure that you're going to be astounded with what God has done and will be doing in my life. I don't know when, but you have to watch to, you know, look, look forward for that. So in Jeremiah 29, this is our hope. Okay? The hope that we've been talking about for the last few weeks. And the Bible tells us in Thessalonians that we are comforted. That no matter what happens, God is with us. That our situations could be bad and will be gone to worse. But you know, the goodness, the kindness, and the faithfulness of God doesn't change. Our God is a constant God. And regardless of your situation and my situation, He will remain the same. He is good, forever be good, and you know, and He will show His goodness to you that it will even chase after you. For sure. And I have been experiencing that. I'm telling you. So, um, the rest, rest in the reassuring truth that Jesus Christ, the source of our hope is coming back soon and we will be with the Lord forever. Amen. Okay. And then I'm going to show you another scripture in Revelation, chapter 21, if you can read that. And God shall wipe, this is the, you know, this is the hope that we have, the ultimate hope that we have. That in God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither there shall be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Knowing that God is in control and has our future, and has our future secure, make all the difference. Amen? So let's pray before we dive in any further. Thank you, God. Lord, we want to thank you that you are the source of our hope. Jesus, we fix our eyes in you, knowing that you are coming is very imminent. Holy Spirit, you are our comforter and our greatest teacher. I pray that you will override my preparations and allow your word to take root in the hearts of the people listening today. Use me as your mouthpiece. Anoint me, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Right. So, let's continue. Living for God's pleasure in view of Christ's coming. So, when we say pleasure, the other synonyms for that word could be delight, joy, happiness, or gratification. So I want to ask you, how has your week been? Are you experiencing the comfort, peace, joy, provision of God in spite of the COVID, in spite of the persecutions, oppositions, and continuous problems? How does the mild to the severe effect of the pandemic in life's you know, the, 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 the effect of the pandemic and life's curveballs. Do you know what the curveballs is? It looks like this. Okay. When we say curveballs, okay, this is 
an unexpected interruption in a normal routine of life. It could be a pressure or a trouble. Okay? So back there, have you experiencing that lately? You know, for the past few months, maybe weeks or year, your life was okay. It was good. But then all of a the sudden, there was this curveball. So how it affects your hope and how it affects your goals in life. And all of us, I believe that we have a certain goal in life. Whether, you know, if you have been working for 30 years, 40 years now, you're looking forward for your retirement. Or maybe my goal yet is maybe after 10 years, I'm going to go to go back to the Philippines or go somewhere in a very nice place and just enjoy my retirement. Or if you are an entrepreneur, you can, you know, your, your goal is I'm going to have a very successful business. Or you just want to be, you know, be successful in your life. If you're a student, I want to finish my study, my studies and find a better job, a nice, you know, a high paying job. Okay? We all have goals. But before I go there, let me tell you a story again. You know, I love story so that you can really understand what I'm talking about. I put it on the screen and we can read this together. Okay? Can you see the story on the screen? Mm. All right, a brilliant young concert pianist was performing for the first time in public. And the audience sat enthralled as beautiful music flowed from his disciplined fingers. The people could hardly take their eyes off this young virtuoso. As the final note faded, the audience burst into applause. Yay! That was very good. You're great. Everyone was standing except one old man up front. The pianist walked off the stage very, very disappointed. And the state manager praised the performance, but the young man said, I was no good. It was a failure. And the manager replied, oh, no, 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 look, look out there. Everyone is on his feet, just except the one old man. And the pianist said, yes. He was very, you know, dejected. He looks very miserable with it. Yes. But that one old man is no other than my teacher. So, can you relate to the story? Do we have the same desire for God's approval as that pianist had for his teacher's praise? Our Lord's approving smile is what really matters. The only goal of this pianist here is to please his teacher. It doesn't matter. Maybe, maybe the girlfriend was there. The you know, family also was there. But his very goal was, I wanted to please my teacher. Because he's been practicing, he's been waiting for and hoping for the, you know, big day. And he really wanted the teacher to be pleased with what, you know, with his performance. So, how about you? What is your greatest goal and why do you do it and to who do you do that for? Again, I strongly believe that we all have different goals. Do you agree with me? Now I'm putting that, you know, I'm putting that thoughts in your mind. Maybe some of you right now are thinking, oh, what's my goal? Right? I'm just kind of, you know, putting that, um, reminding you, what is your goal? Okay? But to tell you what, no matter what our goal is in life, the Bible, Okay? The Bible tells us that we must make it our goal in life is to please God. And the Bible is very clear with that. So in Thessalonians, this is our verse for today. It says there, Finally, dear brothers and sisters, we urge you in the name of the Lord Jesus to live in a way that pleases God as we have taught you. You live this way already, and we encourage you to do so even more. For you remember that we thought you by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. So everybody, again, everybody lives to please somebody. It could be your wife. It could be your husband. It could be your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your children, someone else. But sadly, some people just live to please themselves. But here, 
in Thessalonians, Paul encouraged the church, the Thessalonians, to persist in pleasing God by the way they live. And again, when we say to please God, it is simply means that we have to bring the light and gladness before Him. So as children of God, I'm talking you about you and me, okay? Pleasing our Heavenly Father should be our highest goal and our highest authority. Not after two years, not after 10 years. Well, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to please God after 10 years, after two years, or maybe tomorrow. No, pleasing God is our highest goal every single day, okay? With all the goals that you have, there must be one topmost priority, and that is to please God with everything that you do. I don't know, I don't know about you. Maybe I'm, talking, I'm also talking to myself. When you wake up in the morning, what do you do? Do you just open your phone and look at the Facebook? Or when you wake up in the morning, you just go straight to the shower? Or you drink your coffee? Or you go jog and have your exercise? <laughs> do you do that? Well, I'm guilty. Sometimes I, I do that. <laughs> but our priority is when we wake up in the morning, seek first the Lord. When you seek God and His kingdom, you definitely you definitely please Him. So that's what we ought to do every morning. The rest of the priorities, there's nothing wrong when you go to work. There's nothing wrong when you, you know, um, you want to be, today, Lord, I'm going to be a good teacher. Today, Lord, I'm going to be a good student. Today, Lord, I'm going to be a good husband, a good wife, good at, you know, whatever you do. But your main goal, Lord, I am going to please you and everything that I'm going to do for the rest of the day, they're just going to follow through, okay? Just follow through. That in everything that you do there, you should please God. We must please God. So now let's go back to the verse. And you see that I put the bold letter finally. What does it mean? Paul's use of um, the word finally does not mean he is finished. Okay? But here, he began the closing section of the letter with practical instruction on how God wants his people to live while waiting for the returning of Jesus, the source of our hope. Okay, so the word finally, it serves, uh, it is actually more of a transition rather than a conclusion. Like Paul is saying here that as for the rest of you, these are the things that I want you to do. Okay? And I also put the word urge. In Greek, it is called parakaleo, means to encourage a reader to do a particular action. So if I say, Maui, I urge you, meaning I am telling you to do something, a particular action. And in this verse, what is that action that Paul's meant? Okay? To live in a way that pleases God. This is what Paul is saying. Like, get your priorities right. The priority of every kingdom citizen or every believer is to please the king, to please God. Now, I'm going to tell you another story. <laughs> okay. So, there was a woman, there was a woman, and then she was watching a football match. And next to her was a um, vacant chair. And then the man came and then asked the woman, Madam, is this chair uh, vacant? Can I sit on it? And the madam said, Oh, it was my husband, but he's dead. <laughs> and then the man said, Oh, oh, I'm very, very sorry, but I was just surprised because there was no other, you know, relatives or friends who would take the chance to sit on the chair. And then the woman said, oh, it's me too. You know, I just don't understand because they all insisted to go on his funeral. Nobody laughed. <laughs> you did not get my story, right? Because... This is, yeah, you did not get the story because the woman had mixed priorities, okay? Her husband is dead, but she was in the football match. Now, if you are the woman, what is your priority? Watching the football match or to be with your husband and with his family in the funeral? So sometimes we are like that. 
okay? It's Sunday instead of maybe going to the church or, you know, opening the TV to watch the online service, we do something else. Our priorities are mixed. You don't know your priority. That's why Paul is telling them, know your priority, okay? And our priority is to live in a way that pleases God, okay? This is what Paul is telling us. Not only the church along in the Thessalonians, but even in the church right now. So, to please God, I will. So, the question now is, Jed, how are we going to please God? Okay. I'm fast. <laughs> Where am I now? So, I put three things and nothing is showing. Okay. I put three things. So, how we can please God? Number one, three points. First one, walk in and maintain God's holiness. That's the first point. The second point, to please God, I will sustain brotherly love. And number three, to please God, I will live a peaceful and responsible life. Okay? So let's go to the point number one. Okay. It says there, to please God. Can you say that with me? To please God, I will walk in and maintain God's holiness. Okay. So, God's will for you is to be holy. I'm not only saying to you, but also to myself. Okay. God's will for us is to be holy. So, stay away from all sexual sin. Then each of you will control his own body and live in holiness and honor, not in lustful passion like the pagans who do not know God and his way. So now just take a look at the meaning of holy. We always see this word, okay? Did I put it there? Not yet. Okay, Paul made it very clear that the will of God for us, the followers of Jesus, is to be holy. Holy means is to set apart for a special purpose, okay? Not to be perfect, but to be distinct from the godless culture of the world and its sexual immorality. So the idea behind sanctification or to be holy is for you and me to be set apart. God wants us set apart from this corrupt culture, and I call it X-rated culture, and its sex sexual immorality. Okay? And in this verse, Paul clearly understood that during his time and on the world to come, which is right now, in the present times, he warned the believers to condemn and avoid conformity to sinful behavior. We need to be living in God's standard. You have your own standard, right? You know, when you look for a husband, you look for a wife, or you look for a job, you set your standard. And God has its own standard, and His standard is not like the world. In contrast to the promiscuous or liberated and destructive culture around us, we have to follow Jesus' teaching about the beauty and power of sex in the haven and committed marriage relationship. It is a covenant. So sometimes, you know, before I did not, I think I did not, well, I did not understood it, okay? I did not, un I did not understand it. Um, I thought that even if I was a Christian, I could still do, you know, I could still do living in together. <laughs> I could, uh, you know, I could still do maybe, you know, having sex with other, you know, other people. Why? Because I saw it in the church, I saw it in the church where I was before, and I thought that doing such things, fornication, premarital before marriage, or, you know, um, just, uh, you know, living in with someone is just okay. I thought it was okay. We were, you know, we, we are Christians, and they're doing it, so I thought, well, maybe I can do that. But again, again, not all good intentions are right, okay? 
Your intentions could be, well, Jed, I want to live in with him because we can save together. We could just, you know, pay the rent together. You know, we could save with food and then we love each other. And, you know, when, you know, we're not compatible, then it's easy for us to split up. No, your intention could be right, but that is not right in the eyes of God. God is not calling us to conform into this world. That's why when he said, I set you apart, God took us from the place of darkness and put us into the place of light. Now that we are set apart, we are in this world and the purpose why he did that so we can be salt and light of this world so that people around us who are doing this will see that we are different because we are serving a God who does not like, you know, uncleanliness and unholiness in his kingdom. But you said, but Jed, uh, being holy is um, difficult. Uh, yeah, because meaning I, I cannot really say no to it. Okay, to tell you, <laughs> living a life, a holy life is not difficult, but it is impossible. Do you know why? Without the power of the Holy Spirit living in you, you cannot say no to any of this immorality. As a human being, it's hard for us to say no because it is your own, it's just, it's your own will. Because, you know, your flesh is telling you, oh, just do it. It's, it's nice. It's fun. It's like, it's like an addiction. The once you have started it, you can't stop it. And the only way that we can stop that is when the Holy Spirit is indwelling in us and will make us holy. And I will explain that further later. Okay? So, where am I now? And you're all, uh, no, you're quiet. And in this verse, sexual purity does not only apply to a married couple. Paul was not only addressing this to married couple. So whatever status you have in life right now, are you single? Are you a widow? Are you a man, a woman? Okay. And regardless of your age, you need to learn to appreciate and give dignity to your body and not abusing it. And those who do not restrain, okay, this is very heavy. Those who do not restrain their sexual desires act more like animals than humans, following every impulse without restraint. You see dogs? <laughs> I'm just going to use dogs, right? When they feel like if they have this sexual urge, they just go and mate, you know, whoever dogs they see on the street. And they don't mind if they do it on the street, in the backyards, or in the front yards. They just cannot control their, you know, they just cannot control their impulse. They just do it. And we are like into these animals if we cannot control our, you know, fleshly desire. Immorality is the opposite of honor. Because if you are in this kind of, you know, in this kind of circulation, it degrades, devalues, and, de you know, debases yourself. Do you know what? God takes sexual misbehavior seriously. And Paul says, it dishonors and destroys people and their dignity. If we want to live a life that pleases God, then we must live by the rules. If you want to have sex, get married first. <laughs> That's the rule, okay? You just can't do that. If you want to please God, then abide with the rules. Then we use our bodies and the gift of sex in the right way. And when you do that, you are pleasing God. You are pleasing God. Amen? So next one. I'm not yet done here. There's still a lot more, okay? So in 1 Peter 2.9, it says here, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So here, First Peter describes that we as believers, you as a kingdom citizen, yes, you who is watching me right now, we are a holy nation. It is a fact. That's why we are separated from the world because God personally chose you. you did, people did not appoint you to, okay, Jed, you're going to be here. No, God chose you, okay? He has chosen you. He has set you apart because He wanted us to be a holy nation doing the purpose for your good 
and for His glory. As I tell you a while ago, when I did not do the things that please God, I really went through okay, the painful consequences of my actions. And God is a holy God. When you say a holy God, He will not let any you know, sin just go unnoticed. There will come a time that what you saw, what you're doing right now, without repentance, you are going to reap the consequences. So God is very serious when it comes to relationship. God is the author of every relationship. He loves to see us having good relationship with others, but when we abuse this relationship, God is very, very furious, and He will make sure that His justice will come to you. Okay? So now, in um, other scripture, in Romans 12, 1 to 2, since we are set apart, okay, do you have, okay, I think I have to read the scripture on the screen. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. What are you going to do? Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And then in verse 2, it says there, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. By testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So since we are set apart, we are not to engage in the sinful activities the world promotes. So you know what I'm talking about. Are you watching for, uh, what do you call the one? Porn. Ah. Are you um, into fornication? This is like sex outside your know, marriage. Or you have also multiple partners with this. Like, you know, when you do sex, it's just like you're changing your clothes. Okay, adultery, all kinds of sex with, with uh, same sex, sex with um, animals, okay? The Lord said, do not, okay, conform to the sinful activities of the world, but rather we are to conform ourselves in our minds, so to that of Jesus Christ. And when we say conform, okay, when we change our mind, you don't say, oh, Jed, I'm going to do this on Sunday and then on Saturday and Monday and then on Friday, I'm going to be okay. I'm just going to do it once in a while. It's like you have a um, schedule. <laughs> Jed, I'm going to stay with my wife on Tuesday and then Monday or maybe from Monday to Friday and then on Saturday and Sunday, I'm going to be with my other mistress. You can't do that. Renewing your mind and conforming to the Word of God is a daily activity and commitment. A living sacrifice to God is the one who does, does not conform, but it is transformed. When your mind is transformed, your actions will follow. If you realize that, oh, oh God, what, oh no, God, what I'm doing right now is against my wife, against my children. If you are into an adultery, you know... You repent. Oh, Lord, changing your minds means you repent. Repent from what? Repent from your wrongdoing. And when you do that, when you are really, really, you know, um, you're not just crying because out of the emotions because you're being caught. Meaning you repent because you realize that what you did is really wrong against God. That transformation in your mind will eventually be transpiring in your actions okay because that is what the holy spirit is doing unto us transformation from the inside and it will be manifesting from the outside through your words your thoughts and your actions and your lifestyle and you cannot fake that okay you know one good thing about god he says in his word that what you try to fake or what you, what you do in the, in the dark, He will expose it in the light. So sooner or later, if you find yourself in this kind of, you know, kind of, um, how to say that, in this, in this circulation, it's not too late for you. God promised you that if you come to Him in repentance, He will make you as a white as a snow, and He is going to restore your dignity, your value, your, you know, He will, he will restore everything to you, what, God, what the enemy has taken from you, okay? God is specialized with that. I, you know, I experienced that. 
when me and Romel did the thing <laughs> before our marriage, but I did not do it with other men, only with Romel. So I'm so thankful that it's still my husband. So, you know, um, we said that, Lord, we want to do the right thing. We want to honor you in our relationship. Until to the day that we got married, we never slept together. Okay? We never slept together. We honored God in our relationship. And that, from that day on, we saw the provision and the blessing of God just coming through and through in our lives. And, you know, that's, that's what I would like to share with you. It is not yet too late. And the more you stay in that relationship, in that immoral relationship, you are going to be destroyed. You're not only destroying your life, but you're also destroying the life of, you know, that person you're involved in. It's going to be very, very complicated. Complicated. That's why God is asking us, live according to my standard, and God will send you all the help that you need so that you can start a fresh and a new life again. Amen? Amen. So where are we now? And then, oh, do you still have time? Okay. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? God wants us to be pure using self-control over our physical bodies. And there is no mistaking in God's directive for young people. I'm talking to the youth right now. This is for you, okay? Young people, young adults, and adults with no husband or wife. No one is safe having sex outside the marriage. No protection works 100% of the time. Even if you escape pregnancy and diseases, there is no escaping being accountable for your actions on the day of judgment. So saving sex for your marriage partner is the best gift for you to give to your spouse. God doesn't want you to chip in it. Staying pure before marriage is one of the most difficult things you do especially in this, you know, modern time, but you will never regret it. So possess, control your body in a way that honor God, and remember that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So your body is not your own. It has been bought with a price. So do not sell your body because God created you wonderfully and you are perfect in his sight so there's no amount of money there's no amount of material things can buy your body don't do that please your body is a temple that's why it says here temple it didn't say house it didn't say home because your body is a place reserved for a highly valued function and that is the indwelling of the holy spirit so do not abuse your body Okay, do not abuse your body. Next, in, okay, number two, number two points now. Walk in maintaining holiness. Oh, I think this is the same, okay? Never harm or cheat fellow believer in, his, in this matter by violating his wife, okay? Or for the Lord's avengers such sin. Okay, affairs are wrong. Again, we go again to the adultery things. But the reality is that people are having them anyway. When we are sexually immoral, we take advantage of and defraud others and we cheat them in greater ways that we can imagine, okay? The adulterer, if you are, you know, in an adulterous situation, you defraud your, your spouse and your children. If you are a fornicator, you're not married, you defraud your future wife or your future husband and your future children and both defraud their illicit partner. We can trust God, okay? It says here that when you do that, we can trust God that He will punish sexually immor that God will punish sexual immorality and that no one gets away with this sin even if it is undiscovered. Okay? So God and the second reason that why we have to live and maintain our holiness is that we have we should be um, sexually pure because of what? Of our calling. The call is not to uncleanliness, but to holiness. I like the other translation in the Bible. It says, therefore, God has not called us to be dirty-minded and full of lust, but to be holy and clean. So remember that calling. 
And on verse 8 there, therefore, okay, anyone who refuses to live by these rules, if you keep on disobeying this rule, okay, you are not disobeying human teaching but is rejecting God who gives His Holy Spirit to you. Anyone who refuses to reject holiness is to reject God. All right? And another thing there that to disobey God's instructions is also to reject God's helper. Does it make sense now? When you, Paul was saying that, well, brothers and sisters, if you're not going to, if you're not going to live by these rules, actually you're not, you're not rejecting the authority of human being. You're rejecting the authority of Jesus, the one who gives the command. And if you disobey these instructions, you disobey these commands, you are also rejecting the help of God to make you a new person. The Holy Spirit who strengthens us and helps us keep the instruction. You know what is the, not, what is the number one job of the Holy Spirit? To make us holy. That is His number one job. So if you keep on rejecting that, what kind of life are you living right now? Maybe you're happy. Are you sure you're happy? Is it a lasting joy that you are, you know, feeling right now? Or is this just a fake joy? So I want you to, I want you to ponder and think about that, okay? And then, the number two points is, okay, live from the holiness. Now Paul move into another one. Sustain brotherly love, okay? But we don't need to write to you about the importance of loving each other. It says here, for God himself has taught you to love one another. We should live a life of increasing love. It wasn't that the Thessalonian church were without love. Their love toward all the brethren was well known. But they had to what? They had to increase more and more in their love. Okay? So that, again, I'm going to tell you another story. Or oh, I've got another story to tell. Okay. So in a cartoon... Lucy, she was, you know, watching the TV. Uh, no, Lulu was watching the TV. And then Lucy demanded, um, could you please change the channel? And then Lulu said, what makes you think you can walk right in here and take over? And then Lucy replied, this five fingers. You see this? Individually, they're nothing. But when I curl them together like this into a single unit, they form a weapon that is terrible to behold. So, Linus replied, Okay, so what channel do you want? <laughs> and then he turned away and he looks at his fingers and said, Why can't you just guys get organized like that? So, God wants us as people to be united. If we are just five fingers, if I'm going to carry a bucket of water with my forefinger, do you think I will be able to do that? No. But if I use my whole hand to carry it, then I can. So peep God wants us to be united in harmony with each other. So Paul is telling us that you've been doing that already. Okay? It's an attitude. This is an attitude. And attitude is very, very important. Okay? You love each other more, but you can still do more. You can still love more. I just don't want to just... Stay like that. You need to excel in loving. Sometimes it's difficult to love. I admit, there are some people in my life that I really find it hard. Okay? I really find it hard to love. But, but, I try. <laughs> because I want to please God. I try to show kindness to them. Okay? I try to be, you know, civil to them kind to be, you know, be good to them. But, you know, I, I just have to do it because for the sake that I can please God and also for the sake of me because I don't want to have people, you know, um, walking around and not saying hi and hello. So this one, Paul changes the subject from sexual love into brotherly love. He was telling us, okay, also the Lighthouse Church, he was not telling us to do something new, but he is urging us to get more of something that we already have and we already enjoyed, that we can never have too much Christian love. God wants us, his people, to be united 
in agreement with each other. Why? Because God is love. Therefore, we His children should reflect that love. You know the fish? You do, fish do not attend classes to learn how to swim. And so is the bird. They don't have to go to uh, flying classes for them to fly. It is automatic because that is their nature. And remember that we are created in the image and likeness of God. And in that likeness, in that character, God is love. Therefore, we have the ability to love one another because we inherit that nature of God that is love. Okay? So, what Paul is saying here, just keep on moving. Keep on moving forward in your relationship and allow your love to grow more and more. And when the Holy Spirit is at work in us, we begin to clearly put, you know, put others in the place of value. Sometimes when the Holy Spirit works in us, you know, sometimes you just walk past that people. But when He starts working in you, you find yourself saying hi and hello to that people. And the one thing that the Holy Spirit will you know, um, be manifesting in our lives when we have that love is we stop making wrong or wronging people and taking advantage of them. If you love a person, do you take advantage of that person? No, right? If you love that person, you're going to hurt that person? Of course not. If you love, the, you love the person as much as you love yourself, and you're not going to do anything to hurt yourself. So that is love that Paul is wanting us to do. Grow. Don't just be great. Don't just be great in it. Excel on it. Okay? Excel on it. Okay, where are we now? I'm almost done. Okay, my almost is, you know. <laughs> so there are two kinds of love there. The progressive love, which is more and more. And then the inclusive love. That we should never stop loving our brothers and sisters. And loving is not selective. I only want to love uh, Maui and, and Digna and Pastor Julie, but I don't want to love Kathy. I don't want to love Joy. No, you don't select the person that you love. It should be inclusive regardless of their personality, of their you know, weaknesses. You love them. Love should be willing to cross boundaries and reach out to everyone. Amen? Amen. Where am I now? Number three. Oh my gosh, I'm on number three. Okay. Live a peaceful and responsible life. Okay. Make it your goal to live a quiet life. When you say a quiet life, this is a life where you paying attention and listening to God and you get to know Him better. Minding your own business, meaning you... What? What you, what you do with this one? Um, you know, because in that time of Paul before, some of the Christians, they, because they were, they were thinking, oh, maybe God is coming very, very soon. They just, you know, they given up their work. And they waited for the Lord's return that they become busy buddies, meaning they become lazy. They spent their time, instead of spending their time working on something that is productive, they spent their time interfering the affairs of others. In Tagalog, nakikiusyoso or nakikialam, okay? So, chismis, ganyan. So, that time, because they are minding the business of others, they had, be, they had become collectors of juicy bits of information and start spreading tales. And we have to, you know, and we as Christians, while we are waiting for the coming of Christ, we should not be busy buddies. We should be busy pleasing the Lord, minding the business of God and not minding the business of others. And the third one, working with your hands. Okay, some of the foolish Christians in the time of Paul, they give up their jobs. They wait for his coming, but it appeared that they have taken advantage of the generosity and, you know, the generosity of other people, accepting financial help with making while making no effort at self-support. It simply meant that they expect things to always come easily. They stop working. They depend on people on their daily needs, on their daily basis, that they become a burden to other people. Yeah. Are we like that? It's okay. Sometimes when we need help, people come and help us. But that doesn't mean to say that you abuse that help. 
early in the morning. Oh, I have no rice. I need to go to Maui's house. Maui, do you have rice in there? Oh, I've got no, um, I've got no whatever, whatever. Oh, I've got no cologne. I've got no lotion. Maui, do you have lotion? Do you have, you know, that <laughs> brother and sisters of yours going to be annoyed with you because your dependency is not on God anymore. Your dependency is on people. See? They use God's blessing as an opportunity to be lazy. Do you do that? Please don't do that. So because of that, because of that deeds, they lost their testimony to the unsaved merchant. Now their life is not um, a life of example to those who don't know God. So when we combine the love of the love of our brothers with work and we walk properly, we become effective witness to the Lord and we win them in Christ. People who are not yet believers in Christ, those who are outside, will see our example and be influenced to become followers of Jesus. When we live to please God, okay? When we make our goal to live a quiet life where we mind our own business and we work, you do your responsibility and God will do His sovereignty. I mean, that's all then people around us will be influenced and they will really want to know what is your secret and you're leading and you're pointing them to jesus and even a channel of salvation for them amen amen so for my now just three more okay here conclusion now okay whatever you do work at it with all your heart as working for the lord and not for man that is our main goal, okay? That our main goal should be to please God and not man or woman. We do things because God wants us to, not because people want us to. We need to treat every situation with great care and do it to our best ability as if we were doing it for the Lord, not for another person. When we start to do this, People will notice there is something different about us and the way we treat others and act. Our actions speak so loudly about what is in your heart. Okay? So, now, this is the application. In Ephesians 4 verse 1, so I, the prisoner for the Lord, appeals to you to live a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. What is that? To live a life that exhibits godly character, moral courage, personal integrity, mature behavior, a life that expresses gratitude to God for your salvation. If we can all embrace and put into action what Jesus has commanded us. Okay, now let's take a picture. Okay, I'm casting out vision. That while we are waiting for his return, we must make it our goal to live a life walking and maintaining our moral purity in an X-rated world. That our response to such hostility should always be love, meeting opposition with grace and generosity, and live our life on increasing love. And we must live a life of an example, lacking nothing, so we can win the respect of others and pointing them to Jesus for salvation. This way, our life is motivated by hope in the coming of Jesus Christ. So, while we hope in Jesus' coming, we must make it a goal to live in a way that pleases God. So, how can someone without a personal relationship with God will live in the way that pleases God? Okay? And how is he going to experience his genuine hope, comfort, love, and peace in everyday living even in the present situation as the, as the one we have? So my closing question is, are you in the relationship with this living, incredible God? who gives tremendous benefits, hope in hopeless, hopeless situations, and peace that surpasses all kinds of understanding. And for those who receive Him as their Lord and Savior, Jesus promised to give a life everlasting. 
So if you haven't done that yet, I pray that you will decide right now. As I've told you before, if you think that your life is not pleasing before God right now, is there something in whatever area in your life that maybe you're not sure, Lord, I'm not sure if I'm pleasing you with, you know, this one or in this area. Or if you don't really know Jesus at all, that He can give you a new life, a new beginning, then I want you to decide right now and experience the love, the comfort, the restoration of a father who will never abandon his children no matter what will happen. The father who can give a new beginning, who can give you a real and genuine hope. Will you pray this simple prayer with me and allow me to lead you? Thank you, Jesus. Lord Jesus, you are unfathomable in terms of your grace, your love, your mercy, your compassion, and all the other things that reflect your character as our God. Jesus, I make a decision to sincerely come to you and ask you to cleanse and forgive me from all of my sins. And unrighteousness. I admit my need of you as my Lord and my Savior. Accept me as your son or as your daughter and help me to put my trust and faith in you that no matter how hard life will beat me down, I will anchor my hope in your word and believe that you will teach me to depend love, honor, and please you in the way I live my life as I await Jesus' coming. Thank you that you will show me that you are bigger than I thought you were. And thank you for saving me and giving me your Holy Spirit so I can start a new life with you. Thank you for making me a new creation. And thank you for giving me a second chance so I can experience the fullness of joy, of love, and peace in your presence. All of this I declare in the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. And for those who are, and for those who are going through tough times right now, I don't know what is your situation. Maybe you're having a problem with your, with your jobs or you don't have, at the moment you're jobless. You're having a problem with your, with your children, with your relationship, with your family. Or you are having trouble with your wife, with your husband. Or even you, you know, even you right now, you just don't know what's happening in your life and you want to get out from that you know, from that um, box of, of um, miserable life. Each one of us is facing different situations that we find it difficult to come out. Then I just want to tell you that God's grace and God's hand is reaching to you right now. That you are not alone. That God sees you. He sees what you're going through. He sees what's in your heart. He sees your situation. He, he knows it more than any other people around you. God is telling that I am here. I can help you. I am the answer to your problems. I am the answer to your situation. He's always been waiting. His hand is right there. And if that is you, just raise your hand. Lord, that's me. And I just want to pray for you right now because our God is a loving God. And His nature, He wants to make, He wants to let you know that I've got you. I can help you. That I, that I will be there every single step of the way. Do you trust me? That's the question of God. Do you trust me? Do you want to know me? Do you want to experience me? Then he was saying, come. 
come to me. And God is embracing you right now, and you can just cry unto Him like a child. You know, when a child is, when a child is hurting, or a child, you know, just strip over, the first thing that the child will do will run straight to the father, run straight to mother, clinging and saying, "Mommy, Daddy, he like, I need your help." And that's exactly what God is doing right now. You run to Him, run to Him. He's a loving Father. And there is no problem that is bigger than our God. There is no problem that is too hard. Or you think it's impossible that God cannot solve for you. He is the answer. Do you trust Him? Do you trust Him? Lord God, you see these people, Father, right now. They might be here inside the church or they might, you know, they're somewhere around the globe. And they are running to you right now, clinging to you as a child, God. And I pray, Lord, that you pour out your love. That you pour out your comfort, Lord, and let them know that they're not alone. They're not alone. Let them feel your love. Let them feel, Father, that they are safe in your hands. That, God, this shall come to pass. That all of the storms that they're going through right now, the sunlight, fair weather is about to come. That this season, Lord, of difficulty will just, you know, they're just passing through. They're just walking through that season. They're not going to stay there. That you promised God that you're going to give them a new beginning. You're going to give them a new fresh start. Thank you, Lord, that we can trust you. And we can hope in your word. That from the days ahead, from this day ahead, God, you're going to show and you're going to manifest your love your comfort, your divine provision and protection, and even your restoration, Lord, in many different phases to extend your loving kindness, your mercy, your grace, and your love to these people who voluntarily came to you. Thank you, Lord, for putting peace in the heart and for strengthening them. They are not alone. You are not alone. Take heart. Be courageous because God is with you. And that is a promise. In Jesus' name I declare. Amen. Amen. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Goodness is running after. It's running after me. When my life lay down, I surrendered up, I give you everything. Your goodness is running out, it's running out to me. Your goodness is running out, it's running out to me. Your goodness is running out, it's running out.
you, Lord God. Wow. So in the same verse in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul remind the Thessalonians these promises. In verse 16, he said, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we that are alive, that are left, shall together with them be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. And in verse 18, he said, Wherefore, comfort one another with his words. Amen? I know we are facing difficulties, hardship, amen? Like the preaching of uh, Jed, right? But, but Paul is encourage, encouraging Philippians to have that passionate love with God. We need to be passionate uh, citizens of heaven doing what God wants us to do while we are alive. Amen? We need to passionate. Amen? And second thing, he said, we should not live a pointless life while we are, while we are here on earth. Check our life. Are we living pointless? Amen? And, and, and third, he, she mentioned about uh, purity. While waiting for the Lord, we know that we are pure, we are cleansed, we are sanctified, we are, uh, we are purchased by the blood of Christ. And that's, that's purity, we are not earning, we are already pure in the eyes of God. And Paul is encouraging us to live that pure life while waiting for Christ. And Port, I encourage you, church, you that are watching, I know we are, we are pacing me, Last, uh, last Thursday, I was uh, really a point of like, you know, giving up. And then I had this difficulty also in, in uh, like problem with my health suddenly. But you know, I, I, I hold on to the promise of God. Amen. Beginning at this year, he said, I'll gonna sustain you. I'll gonna protect you. Amen. And my peace will always be with you. Support, he said, we need to live a, perp with a, a life with a purpose. Whatever we, what, whatever we are doing, we need to live that life. Amen? With purpose. That's why this morning when, when I was praying, the Lord told me, you don't need to uh, uh, to put the brake. You, you don't need to stop. You need to accelerate. Amen? We will not be hindered by this pandemic, by this situation, by this restriction, right? By the difficulties that, that we are facing. Me, I am, I, I am also have that feeling. I know other, other people. We are separated with our loved ones. We cannot go. We cannot visit them. Right? I know that feeling also. Lacking, amen. But I believe God is sustaining you because the Lord promised that He will never leave us. In the end of the letter of Paul, he said, The Lord is faithful and He will do it for us. Church, let me pray. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for this morning. Thank you for encouragement. Thank you, Lord God, for reminding us that we as people and citizens of heaven, Lord God, we need to live a life pleasing unto you, O God. Lord, people are having so much, Lord God. But I know, Lord God, there's a benefit, Lord God, in affliction. There's a benefit in hardship. Because we are being developed, Lord God, in the likeness of Christ, Lord God. Purified, Lord God. Being a, becoming glorious and glorious, Lord God, until the coming of Christ. And Lord, we are so grateful, Lord God, 
in everything, Lord God, that we are facing, Lord God. Lord, the mom, Lord God, yes, Lord God, the mother, Lord God, yes, Lord God, right now, comfort them. A husband, Lord God, who has facing difficulty, Lord God, in his life, in his family. Lord, speak to him, Lord God, that you are with him. And he's not alone. And for those people, Lord God, that are having that difficulty, Lord God, right now I, I speak strength. I declare God's presence. I declare the fire of the Holy Spirit to be upon you. If you are sick right now, I declare wholeness and healing in the name of Jesus Christ. Because the God that we serve is alive and He is faithful to His promises. Father, I thank you. We magnify, we glorify. Church, God bless you and see you next week. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. You are good, good. Hallelujah. Oh, It's running out.